Good morning for those that are joined already. If not, uh, we'll continue to welcome you as you join on board. Uh, my name is Tim and this is Dave and we'll get started in about five minutes. Remember the days when all those stickers were, were not allowed. <laughs> the, the, and, the one investigator that initiated it just steamrolled. <laughs> I always used to ask him, "How'd you come?" I just that? that hard hat sitting on a shelf yeah. in my house. That's my you know. I always laughed at that one, and I just thought I'd sneak that just how it just turned into that. No stickers were allowed. Big thing, you know. Then you get that hard hat where you, you can't see through it anyway, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you, you give a construction worker a sticker, that's that's like gold. That's right. Yep. Yep. But that was team conversation. Again, those of you that have joined just recently, welcome aboard. Uh, we'll be starting in just a couple minutes. Uh, we encourage you, though, to ask lots of questions through the chat system. Uh, so if you have some that you are wanting to get answered, you know, please jot them down so you don't forget. And we're going to let you chat in at any point in time you want. We don't have to wait till the end of the, end of the webinar. We'll, uh, we'll answer them as they come in. So just a couple more minutes and we'll get things rolling here. Crystal, I see that your uh, hand is up. So if you have a question, uh, you can always private message me as well, but you can put it in the chat. There was that much of that. Yeah. Speaking of that, we raise our hand because I think we'll find that. Can you tell who the company are on board or not? Not about in. Maybe I'll ask you that. One minute. One minute. One minute. Is Heather going to give us that? Well, welcome, everybody. 
It is uh, time to get started. So if we have a few join in, that's not a problem. We'll uh, catch everybody up. Again, welcome to our webinar today on OSHA record keeping. We uh, have a lot of information and we encourage you to ask questions through the chat system. Uh, my name is Tim Peterson, uh, with, been with OECS for now 28 years. Sitting to uh, my side here is Dave, and I'll let Dave introduce himself. Yeah, Dave for cool. I just started with the company a little over a year ago. Um, been in the profession for, you know, over three decades. And uh, he's a little shy on that part, but he came out of the world of Minnesota OSHA, yeah. so uh, you can pick on him if you want on that part of it. But um, he's going to bring it to a different perspective as far as the OSHA record keeping on the compliance side. Uh, we work on it not only in compliance, but for the benefit of you, the company, on, on controlling and documenting potential and actual losses. So let's get started. We're going to go through all these different parts, uh, purpose, scope, the forms, the criteria. And at any point in time, as I said again, if there are questions, please don't wait till the end. Just chat them in. Um, we'll get interrupted. We'll talk about it. And we'll give them to your answer. And if there's more detailed information that you need, our, our contact information will be at the end of the presentation that you can email or call either Dave or I to get a better definition or a better answer on your questions. So purpose, required employers to record and report work-related fatalities, injuries, and illnesses. This is really important because it helps you control and understand where losses are coming from in your world. But Dave, as you look at this on the OSHA side, what do you see on the on the value of what the purpose of this program is? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple, you know, I mean, first and foremost, it provides you a summary for yourself. It gives you a snapshot of what happens so that it can potentially steer your safety program. You know, maybe you identify some trends that you feel, okay, maybe we need to focus a little more on, on this issue or on these types of incidents. So it's, it, it provides a, a summary, a snapshot of what's been going on to hopefully help guide your safety program. So the other thing that comes up often is size exemptions. And again, I'm gonna to lean towards Dave on this because yeah. he's been involved in that area before, but as it says on the screen, if your company had 10 or fewer employees at, at all times during the last calendar year, but we did a little confusion once in a while on this OSHA or the BLS deal. And that's where I want to have Dave do a little bit of uh, input on his part. Well, I mean, the key thing is, you know, did you exceed that 10 employees or not? And that's at any time during the calendar year. Um, and you want to make sure. So when you're counting employees or when you're considering number of employees, you have to include part-time, seasonal, even the temporary employees that you supervise. Uh, Anytime you exceed 10, you have to maintain a log. And that's company-wide. So when your company exceeds 10 employees, you'll be required to keep an OSHA log. And again, there may be people on, the, on this webinar that are Minnesota-based companies or are outside of the state of Minnesota. We're going to attempt to uh, explain both sides of it because, again, um, uh, state OSHAs uh, may have uh, a few different rules than federal OSHAs. Is that correct, Dave? Mm -hmm. So, again, make sure you ask questions if you have any unknowns. Exemptions, all industries in agriculture, construction, manufacturing, utilities, wholesale trades, they are covered. And the transportation, retail, service sectors, some industries are partially exempt. And that's, again, I want to lean towards Dave on that partial exemption, which, which may fall into that category. Yeah. The exemption is going to apply for states that have a federal OSHA program. They're going to have that exemption. But there's like, what, 23 state plan states. Uh, they may opt to not include that exemption. And Minnesota is one of them. Minnesota does not have an industry exemption. Any employer that has more than 10 employees at any time during the calendar year will need to keep an OSHA 300 lot. So again, if you're a federal state, you have the exemption. If you're not sure if you're a state administered program, if you have a state administered OSHA program and you're not sure, just you know, get in touch with that area office. Excellent. So covered employers must record each fatality, injury, or illness that is work-related. And we'll get into the details of what truly is work-related and what is not. There's a lot of unknowns. So again, if you have questions, 
Also, what is a new case and what meets that criteria? And again, we have the CFR numbers up there, but we hope that by the end of the webinar, you know, you may not have to go back to that CFR 19 uh, uh, zero one and answer questions that hopefully we have them answered for you on that part of it. So that's where our ultimate goal is. So we have a couple polling questions. Have you completed your form 300A yet? Uh, we'll get that poll implemented now and we'll have the results up in just a few seconds. So if you could just get in when it activated, hit A or B, I would appreciate that. So we have an idea where people are. Couple more seconds. We're at eight, we're at eighty two percent that have answered. Thank you. All right, guys. I'm going to close the. I'm going to close the poll now. Okay. And we'll pop up the results in a second. Can you see those guys? Kim and Dave, can you see the yes. results? Okay, perfect. Yeah, looks like most haven't yet. Uh, we'll certainly talk about you know what's required or, or when you have to post the information. There was some not sure, so if there are questions on on this form and what you do with it, you know, hopefully we'll have all that answered. Okay, I'm not advancing. We have a, a hiccup here. We're not advancing the slide. Hang on there, folks. We'll get back on track here. What happens if you go backwards? Nothing at the moment. Yeah, exactly. There. We'll get our technical advisor in here. There we go. There we uh, go. I can see that. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. Sorry for that a little bit of a bit pickup on that part. So one of the things is is it is it recordable? Is this social recordable? So this flow chart helps you understand that a little bit. And in, in the standard, there's also a, a yes, no flow chart that you can look at. Again, if you have questions, please ask. But we're going to go through each one of these individually to give you a better explanation of what it is. So if you want to advance on to the next slide. Step one, did the employee experience a work-related injury? Well, under the definition, an, an injury or illness is an abnormal condition or disorder. Injuries include cases such as so we looked at all these different elements, and if the answer is yes, we fulfill that and we meet that, so far step one is it's an injury for, that we got to record. Step two gets into, is it really work-related, okay? And again, determination of work-related is it is presumed for injuries and illnesses resulting from events or exposures occurring in the work environment unless an ex exception specifies apply specifically applies, excuse me. So Dave, where would that category fall into if you wanna cover that just a little well, bit? I think the key thing is if it happened at work or if the symptoms initiated at work, you have to presume it's work related unless you can you know, determine that it wasn't or that you know, this symptoms or the injury or illness was due to non-work related events. So you presume it's work-related if it happened at work until you can determine otherwise. Okay, step three. Oops, we missed one. Forward, okay. So oh. what is the work environment? Excuse me, it's an extension on that part. Is defined as establishment and other locations where one or more employees are working or present as a condition of employment. So when we look at that work environment, that's part of the, one of your definitions. Did it happen? and involve where that employer um, had to come to work as a conditional of employment. Yeah, and again, it's not just the physical work environment. It could, it's just any anything, any of the equipment or materials that they use as part of that work. Got it. 
Thank you. Travel status. Some of you may have employees that travel throughout the United States or from within the state or around. Uh, any injury or illness that occurs while an employee is on travel status is work-related if it occurred while the employee was engaged in work activities. Again, there's that what-if scenario and stuff in the interest of the employer. Uh, home away from home, uh, uh, deter a person reason for not work-related. Those are some things you want to make sure. If you're not sure, you ask, and we get that definition clarified. Yeah, yeah again, checking into a hotel, that's, yeah, it's not, you're not engaged in business activity. Um, and again, if you're just going somewhere for personal reasons, yeah, that again, you're not going to consider that as being work related. Again, if you're engaged in business, you know, you're actively involved or you're commuting or going to a client location, you know, that's different, you know, then, then it's going to be considered work related or it'll be, you know, part of the work activities. Excellent. Okay. Work at home, injuries and illness that occur while an employee is working at home are work-related if. Again, you, there's always that if that comes into play, which you got to clarify. Occur while employee is performing work for pay or compensation at home and are directly related to the performance of work yeah. rather than general home environment. Yeah, key thing is, you know, if you trip on the family dog and you get hurt, you know, you're not doing work at that point. That's just, you know, part of the home environment. If you slip on your kitchen floor, yeah, you're not performing or you're not engaged in work activities. So you're not going to consider those kind of injuries. But if you were performing a work task, got hurt, you picked up a box of files, dropped them and smashed your toe, you know, that that's going to be different. Then you would have to consider that directly related to work activities. And then we get the lovely exemptions, which exception, excuse me, that we looked at. And so as you go through those situations, these are the things that you want to be able to clarify whether it is. And, and one of the ones that comes up often is the third bullet, eating, drinking, or preparing food or drink for personal consumption in the break room, or that type of thing. And then the last one that comes up often is the motor vehicle accident in the parking lot or access roads during the commute. And I'm going to let yeah. Dave again touch on that a little more. Yeah, I guess with the eating and drinking, again, if it's just for your own personal consumption, you're not going to consider that a work-related you know, event. That's going to be separate. Obviously, if you're working in a restaurant and you're preparing food for customers and you get hurt, obviously that's a different thing. You know, Then that now becomes work-related. As far as commuting, yeah, as long as you're commuting to a work location, you know, that's just part of your normal commute to your home establishment, wherever you work, you know, that whole process of commuting is going to be considered, even when you're walking out of the car and maybe you get bumped by a vehicle in the parking lot, that's still not, that's still considered part of the commute. So you would not consider that work related. So what about the construction side? Because it says here the exemption is for parking lots and, and road accesses, but what if you're on a construction site? Well, yeah, again, if you have an accident in a construction zone, that's going to be a different story. Then you would have to consider that. But otherwise, normal commute. You know, if you're commuting from a home office to a client site, or not, when I, I don't want to use the word commute, but if you have to travel to a client site from like a home office, that's different. That's not your normal commute. So you want to keep that in mind as well. Great. Step three, is the injury or illness a new case? And again, the definition and the, and, the, and the explanation of what it is right there in front of you on the screen, but it's important to, to understand whether this is a repeat uh, or reoccurring injury or versus a new one, whether you put it on a previous year or you have to start a new entry on the, the, the new year of 2023. Yeah. Key thing, did you have an injury or illness that affected that same body part before? If not, it's going to be a new case. But also, if maybe you had a previous injury, it was felt that it was fully healed, and then something at work aggravated that same area again or aggravated that injury again, you know, that's going to be a new case. So either you hadn't had an injury or illness at that that affected that same body part, or if you did, it was you know, medically resolved, it, it fully healed, or at least to the extent possible, and then it got re-aggravated. Those are going to be considered new cases. 
Step four in our chart, does the injury or illness meet the general criteria or population to specific cases? So the general criteria, all injury or illness is recordable if it results in one or more of the following. And again, the death days away from work, I can't come back to work. Again, it's not the day of the accident, but for the injury the following day. Are there any restrictions? I can't do my own normal job. I have to change my job function or the length of hours I work, things like that. Transfer to another job, medical treatment beyond first aid. And we'll get into the, what the first aid is in a few minutes too. Loss of consciousness, the person passes out. It's automatically recordable. Significant injury or illness diagnosed by the practitioner, which uh, the doctor, the nurse, the uh, uh, health healthcare practitioner. So those are your general criteria that if it meets that, it is recordable. Tim and Dave, we have, a, yeah. we have two questions, same question, mm -hmm. <laughs> two people, same question. What about if someone slips in the slips on ice in the parking lot when they're coming to and from work? Yeah, I mean, we're going to touch on that uh, in a nutshell, you know, once they're on the premises and if it's a company owned parking lot, as soon as they get out and start walking, they're they're on company premises. And if they slip and fall and get hurt and it results in in, you know, and it, the injury meets the criteria yeah you would have to record that as a work-related case and i we will get into that or we'll touch on that further further in i have another question before you move sure. on uh does an mri without days away from work or restrictions need to be recorded not and again we'll touch on this also but not if it's just diagnostic you know if, if you don't detect anything further and there's nothing further that needs to be done as far as medical treatment, it doesn't impact their ability to work, then, then just getting that MRI alone, no, it wouldn't be. Or they go in and have x-rays to see if there's a fracture or a crack or whatever, and they're, and, and they're, and they're negative, you know, that's just a diagnosis to try to determine if there is anything that's done. So no, those yeah. things don't count. So we did in the days um, away, uh, record if case involves one or more days away from work. And again, the day of the injury or the accident does not count. It's the next day. Uh, we check the box away from cases and we count the number of days and do not include the day of the injury. But every day in the calendar is counted. So if it's if they can't come to work for three days and it happens to be a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we still count those three days. Everybody, everybody has 365 days on their calendar. And, and again, it's it's based on could they have work, even if it's even if they weren't scheduled to work, but they but uh, the injury would have prevented them from working, whether they were scheduled, if they happen to have been scheduled. Yep. It, yeah, you would still count it. You would still, you know, record those whatever number of days away. And, and also remember, you're not counting half days or partial days. So if someone happens to come back middle of the day and start working again, you still count that as one full day. Days counted, we've already covered that a little bit, but the thing you wanna remember is it doesn't matter if they're scheduled vacation, if it's a holiday or whatever, we count all, all 365 days as live days. The thing that you also remember is that no injury can, can go past 100, 180 days. So we have a cap. So somebody is out of work and they're restricted or lost time for 240 days, we still cap it at 180. Mm -hmm. So that's the most you can have in any any one injury. I mean, I, it, the way OSHA feels, it's like if it's reached 180 days, I mean, it's a serious incident. You know, we don't have to keep counting. And I know way back, you know, prior to this latest rule, um, I remember seeing OSHA logs that would have, you know, 380 days, you know, and counting on some cases. And it's like, you know, at some point, what's the point? We know it's a severe case. And that's why it was decided with this current rule that we'll just cap it at 180 days. Yeah, we know it's serious. We don't have to keep wasting time counting, you know, more days. And then remember that third bullet there may stop count day if employee leaves the company for an unrelated reason. It's just that, hey, we're gonna switch jobs. I have a better offer or whatever. Their last day of employment is the last day you count. Yeah, as long as it's not 
because of the injury or illness. Right. Yeah. But that never happens. Yeah. <laughs> and a, a point to make on the last bullet, um, if a medical opinion exists, you know, if you have a physician stating that, hey, this person needs to take five days off from work, that's what you're going to put on the log, regardless of if they show up earlier than that, you know, the worker. So number one, you should really try to follow what the doctor prescribes. But secondly, if they provide a medical opinion, that's what you're going to follow. That's what you're going to enter on your log. So if they say that a worker needs to take five days off, you're going to put five days away on your injury log. That's, that's why it's really important too to get your the doctor's report back to understand and realize what they're telling you that employee can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. So it's important to not just state their word for it, but get that doctor's opinion. And to follow it. Yeah, yep, really follow try to it. follow through on it because yep. they're they're trying to help resolve that that injury or illness case. So uh, if you follow that, hopefully it gets resolved quicker. I, I have a question um, and it's about the COVID. So it's about what, <laughs> what about, I know, what about employees absent with COVID and their quarantine days? Um, I guess we have a slide yeah, directed hold, hold to that. On to so that. maybe we'll, yeah, let's do for hold that. Hold on to that question. On. We're going to get yeah. to the COVID slide, which I know everybody is anxious to yeah. find out about because we all, we all love the COVID world. So yeah. we'll get to that in a few minutes. But thank you. So restricted work days recorded if the case involves one or more days of restricted work or transfer. We check the box, which will go through the forms. And again, we do not count the day of the injury or the illness. The That's counting pretty is pretty similar to days yep. away. So, yep. yeah. You might have answered this question on that last slide, but I'll I'll read it out. Mm -hmm. I had an employee out for 90 days and he was on restrictions for 22. Do I enter both? Uh, we'll touch on this again, but no, you only classify the worst outcome on a case. And I think that's what this question is getting at. Uh, a lot of times I'll, I'll have seen on the log that someone will check off days away as well as days restricted, you know, or transferred. Uh, when they're classifying the case, but that's, yeah, you only check one and that's the worst outcome. So days away would be considered the worst outcome of those two. Medical treatment, uh, we'll get into some details on that as we get into it, but medical treatment is the management and care of a patient compared to disease or disorder. It does not include a visit to your primary health for observation or counseling or the diagnostic procedure, which we talked about as far as MRIs or, or x-rays, and then if it's considered strictly first aid. And there's an all-inclusive list that's considered first aid that we'll show here shortly, but I just wanted to kind of go back that this, this should answer the previous question. Yeah, just getting an MRI or just getting an x-ray or whatever, or getting a blood test, you know, that in itself isn't considered medical treatment. If it identifies something that then requires treatment, okay, that's different. But yep. the testing or the diagnostic procedure in itself isn't. This is this list that we'll go through briefly. And again, um, we can send it to people if you want. It's accessible through the uh, the, the uh, Code of Federal Regulations. Uh, what If it falls into this category, it is considered first aid. So non-prescription medication, uh, take uh, two ibuprofen or two aspirin, the immunization of tetanus, uh, cleaning or flushing, wounds, coverings. So if they put a band, a butterfly bandaid on or steri strips, um, it's not considered the same as if they were to put stitches in. Uh, hold, cold pack, heat pack, non-rigid supports, again, uh, an ACE bandage, that type of a thing. Temporar temporarily mobilizing a device to transport to the hospital or to a clinic. Those are the first list and we can go to the next page, which again, uh, continues on. All right. I wanted to make one quick comment on the medication, the prescription versus, you know, non-prescription. Um, as Tim mentioned, yeah, you can take a couple ibuprofen and it would be, you know, non-prescription. But if you end up taking four of those, where all of a sudden you get up to like 800 milligrams, all of a sudden now you reach that prescription level. If 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 that happens, then I'll, then at that point, you have to consider it medical treatment. So just something to keep in mind. I mean, if you use non-prescription medication, but then you use it at a prescription dose, you still would treat it as a medical treatment and not first aid. Again, drilling the finger, if you have a damaged, you know, smashed fingernail or whatever, the eye patch, 
removing foreign objects uh, by using irrigation or cotton swab. Again, not you know, pulling them out with a tweezer type thing, that's different. Um, when we look at those factors, those are the things, somebody puts a finger guard on so it protects it from further damage. Uh, massages, so now everybody can offer massages to their clinics, to their employees, right? That's right. And then drinking fluids or relief for heat stress. Again, data aids or support drinks or whatever it may be are, are not considered yeah. Um, recordable. Yeah, and again, you know, kind of going back to the second to the last bullet point, massage therapy would be considered first aid. Um, obviously, if you get a you know, some kind of an adjustment from a chiropractor or a physical therapist. Okay, that's different. That would be considered medical treatment. I have a question. Yes. Uh, is the sick day a lost day? Does the lost day make this reportable? You mean just for like a seasonal cold or flu? I mean, that kind of stuff wouldn't be considered recordable, if that's what that means. Gary, if you can let us know if that's if that's what you yeah, mean. I mean, you know, just your standard cold or flu, the seasonal stuff, that's not going to be considered uh, a case that would be, you know, you wouldn't have to consider it for recordability. Okay. Um, okay. Let, let us let us know, Gary, if that's if that's answered. If you need more, uh, just put it in the chat. Thanks. They lose consciousness for whatever reason. It is recordable if the person right. goes unconscious. Okay. And again, it doesn't doesn't matter how long or for how long it, they could be out for one second. It's still going to be recordable. So the the length of or the duration of them losing consciousness isn't the factor here. It's whether they did or didn't. Got it. The bloodborne pathogens. Uh, this is your your uh, hepatitis, your HIV. Uh, record all work-related needle sticks and sharp instrument situations. And we'll get into that a little bit more detail on the record-keeping side, but record splashes and other exposures to blood or other potential infection materials if results in a diagnosis if of the blood-borne disease. And it meets that general criteria again. Yep. Yeah. And a key thing with like the needle sticks and the sharps, I mean, they have to be contaminated with, you know, blood or other potentially infectious mm -hmm. material to make it recordable. If it wasn't contaminated, then it may or may not. It depends. You know, if they get if you get a cut that's severe enough that it requires stitches, okay, now it's medical treatment, it'd be recordable. If you get a cut, but it's just, you know, hey, a band-aid takes care of it, then no. So the key thing is, was it contaminated? And if it was, you record it automatically. If it wasn't, then it just depends on the outcome. Here's the case that everybody was waiting for, right? COVID-19. Uh, OSHA considered three factors to determine if an employer has complied with this obligation and made reasonable determination of whether it's work-related. And uh, those three bullets, you, you have to say yes to, correct, Dave, in order to make it or consider it work-related. So I am going to definitely turn this over to well, you because you weren't that far out of the world of OSHA yeah, back then. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't enjoy this time frame, but yeah, I mean, you really have to take a look at what that worker was doing. If it's someone that's really directly involved with the general public, you know, and they're constantly interacting with people, you know, then maybe it's, you may want to, you know, consider it, maybe then potentially it's more likely to have been work related. Uh, but if it's, someone that hardly interacts with the public, they're just doing their own work somewhere else. Boy, I'm sorry. I, I think you could strongly argue that it wouldn't have been work-related, that they must have contracted it somewhere else. So you have to take those factors into consideration. Obviously, if you work in healthcare and you've been bombarded by, by patients, yeah, you know, then it's probably more reasonable to think that, yeah, it was probably due to work activity. So just, you know, you have, to, you have to investigate and really look at what that individual was doing and how much they do interact with the general public. The bottom line, don't assume that they test positive for COVID that it's work-related. Yeah, yeah, you, can, you certainly have the right to look into it further. Um, and I think going back to the question, I mean, if, if, if getting the illness results in them having to quarantine or take days off, you know, you're going to record it as such. So it would be days away. Correct. So we encourage questions on that if you have them. Um, 
The next one we want to talk about is hearing loss. So companies that are working in loud environments, you know, that uh, uh, go in and they do their annual audiometric testing and such. Uh, when that testing is done and your audiologist sends back the report, in most cases, they're going to they're going to put in that report whether it is a standard threshold shift, which makes it recordable and stuff. So we're not going to spend a lot of time because it's all numbers. If there's an area that you are concerned about with noise levels and whether it a hearing loss or a deviation in the standard threshold shift counts, please let us know and we can talk to you individually a little bit more about that. Yeah. And again, it doesn't require both ears, you know, to have that loss. It's one, you, you know, you can have one ear that sustains a, a loss. The key thing is, yeah, you got to have that standard threshold shift identified. And then the hearing loss has to be significant enough over that two, three, and 4,000 hertz frequency range that it averages out to, you know, 25 decibels or more above that audiometric zero. So those are the two criteria. But first and foremost, yeah, they need that standard threshold shift identified. And remember, if there is a standard threshold shift, you, you can retest that individual within yeah. 30 days because maybe they had a cold or mm -hmm. they were exposed to loud noises. So again, you can retest to verify that it came back factual. Yeah, that way during that time, you wouldn't have to record it yet if you knew you were going to retest again. So good point. I have a I have a question about that. Uh, you might have answered it, but I'll read it anyways. Are all baseline audiometric test shifts automatically considered a reportable? I think maybe I'll. Oh, okay, I, maybe they're asking if they get a standard threshold shift, is it automatically reportable? Not necessarily, because they still have to average that 25 decibel hearing loss over the two, three, and 4,000 hertz frequency from audiometric zero. You know, if they, if, if they're, if they're hearing loss, you know, if they drop down beyond that 25 decibel average, then that would be the second criteria that would then make it recordable. So they, so they have to have the threshold shift, and then they also have to have enough hearing loss to you know, average 25 decibels or more above that audiometric zero. So the baseline, I guess maybe this will help too. You're comparing your, the standard threshold shift compares to the baseline audiogram. The second criteria is just, okay, do they have enough hearing loss that it averages 25 decibels or more above that audiometric zero? So if you have a new employee that starts and you create the baseline, that's what you're responsible for from that point forward. They 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 may have a a hearing issue when you hire them, but you're not responsible for what they brought into the industry with what you're exposing them from that point forward. Is that the easy way to yeah, kind of lay it out? Yeah. yeah, you get that baseline, and then from there you can compare to determine the threshold shift, and then from there, you know maybe they've had such a significant hearing loss already that they didn't drop. You know that, um, you know they're just going to be below or above that 25 decibel average in this, those kind of circumstances, yeah, just getting the threshold shift again, puts them into the recording criteria. So, so I have a, go ahead, sorry. That's okay. I have a few questions around this. Uh, so our continual annual, annual audio metric tests required if those noise levels are reduced to less than PEL. Well, well, yeah, the the audiograms, the requirement to do the audiograms is all based on whether their average noise exposure reaches 85 decibels or higher. So yeah, if they can control the noise to below that level, then no, they don't have to do the audiograms. They can choose to still, but they don't have to. And a lot of companies might just have everybody go through and get an audiogram, even if they don't have that exposure. Maybe some are at or above and some aren't but they just send everyone through. That's that's the employer's choice at that point. But yeah, if their noise exposure is at that 85 or above for an eight hour average, then yes, they need to have that audiogram done every year. And that's what if, important. Go ahead. And what if an employee refuses to be tested after a potential shift? So they tested with the standard threshold shift. So you want to retest them and they say, no, I'm not going to be retested. That's a question. Uh, yes, yes, exactly. yes. yes. I, I, I believe you can't force it on them if I'm remembering correctly. You can't force retesting. 
But it's to their advantage to yeah. see if it was factual or not. But that's that's, yeah. that's reason how you want to bring it across. The reason we're retesting to see if that result was really factual or if there was other elements that were involved that might have skewed the results again, a cold. You know, uh, maybe they went to like a that. you know loud concert the night before. I mean, um, yes, I'll raise my hand. I did that once. Uh, you know. So I, I personally wear hearing aids for their hearing loss, and I want to make sure that the testing is done accurately so I know yeah. where I'm at, and that's a benefit to the individuals. So. Yeah, ideally, you're supposed to schedule these so that you have a couple of quiet days prior, ideally, you know. Um, obviously, that doesn't always work, and, and so, yeah, it doesn't hurt to get a retest under those yeah. extreme circumstances. Thank you, though. Whoops, I guess I should stay That's here. fine. No, the, the, the logs we're going to cover briefly, so if there's questions... And again, whether you handwrite them or they're electronic on that part, we'll get into that too. But this 300 law that we're just popping up on the screen now, um, I, I guess I can move ahead. Uh, is, is, is the one that you fill out and you got to keep current and accurate as far as filling all the deals. And when I worked with companies, I looked at this 300 law and it should give me a, a, a image of what's going on out in that industry and the types of injuries. So for instance, the letter F, is to describe the body parts. Be very, very detailed so that I can visualize what got injured and and what part of the body. Not I just hurt my right finger. You now I hurt the palm side of my right finger uh, above the first knuckle. You know now you have a better visual on that. I always tell people just try to be provide as much detail in as few words as possible. So yeah, laceration, right index finger above. You know, you know above second knuckle. You know just try to provide some details because it may. It may be significant depending on the work they're doing in terms of trying to identify the cause and, and ways to prevent it from happening again. But yeah, provide you know sufficient detail to get you know to have some idea of where that injury, you know, what what was affected. On the far left are the, the case number, it's a number you can pick and choose, but whatever you do, make sure it's on all the documents as a paper trail so you know that all the documents tie back to that one case too. Yeah, make it unique, a yep. unique number. Yep. Yep. And the biggest thing here too, again, is just fill out the whole form. Again, relates back to a previous question. When you classify the case, you're only checking one box. Even if a case had both days away and job restriction, you're still checking the one box, the, the worst outcome, which is days away. Obviously, if there's been a fatality, you're just gonna check that box. Or if there was no lost days or restrictions, then it's just the other recordable. Gee, your niche form. Uh, we get into is your 301, which is your reporting form uh, for incidents and investigation part. There's a lot of things you can do. Uh, a lot of insurance companies will provide their own. As long as it have all this detailed information, you, you can use different forms, correct? Yeah, it, yeah. You don't have to use this one, but it has to fill all the different criteria that we see on there. Mm -hmm. And it's important because you can use this now as an, an internal analysis of what time of the day, how long a shift, what time, and are we doing any trends that, hey, most of our accidents are occurring 30 minutes within the shift start or, or 30 minutes before the shift ends. So now we're running into fatigue. So again, this is a form that's also very beneficial for you. Yeah, it's a little bit of an investigation form. I will say, I doubt I've seen this specific form used much because yeah, again, most employers just use a first report of injury form through their work comp carrier. And that's fine. Again, as Tim said, the key thing is, are you still documenting the same information in the same manner that they want you to on the 301? That's the key thing. And then our last form is, oh, go ahead, you have a question? Yeah. If there are more days of restrictions over lost days, do you still check lost days as yes. the most, per okay. Yes, yep, that's still the worst outcome. Even if it's one lost work day, that's still the worst outcome, regardless of how many restricted days. This is the 300A, and this is when we asked that about 50% of the people haven't filled it out yet, uh, where we just take the, the totals from the 300 and we transfer them by letter to that. And this is the one that gets posted uh, for the employees uh, to see for the months of February, March, and April, which we'll talk on. But on the far right, that is also the data that you, you need to fill in. And a lot of times it gets missed as far as your SIT code. Uh, and then your annual average number of employees and average number of hours, which I'll let Dave talk briefly on those two categories because that gets missed once in a while yeah. or incorrectly filled in, I would say. Yeah. I mean, 
you can enter either a, a SIC code or this North American Industrial Classification Code, the SNAKES code, which is really the more current, you know, classification system used. Uh, and you can look this kind of stuff up online. Um, you could maybe even check with your comp carrier if you're not sure. They may already, they may have it. Uh, th they should have that classification for you. Otherwise, just, you know, even a area OSHA office, if you contact them, they could probably help you look it up. But you can look it up online too. Um, as far as average number of employees, the forms packet that OSHA provides, they have like a sample or an example way to calculate it. You can just base it on, you know, how many employees were working per pay period. Each pay period, you add up those number of employees, and then at the end of the year, you, you add up the total number of employees divided by the number of pay periods, and that'll be a way to get an average number of employees that way also. Um, as far as total hours, again, you can base it on average number of employees times whatever number of hours would be considered full-time, and 2,000 is a typical number used. So you would just multiply the number of employees times 2,000. The last thing you really want to emphasize is that at the very bottom, it's signed off by, and this should be signed off by the highest ranking official in the organization, because what OSHA wants is that highest ranking official, president, owner, whatever, to really understand what's going on in his or her company. So it's really important to have that, that person involved and say, this is the number of lost days we had. This is the number of restricted days we had, that type of thing, and, uh, and get them to sign off yeah. on it. And if you have multiple establishments and, you know, maybe it's not the CEO that signs off, but then you better have the highest ranking person at that establishment signing off. So the the, the whole point is we want a top ranking person, you know, an owner, a uh, company officer, or someone like that signing off. Many times I've seen the HR manager's name there, and that's not really who should be signing off. So okay. keep on moving on there. I have a few questions around this uh, yes. slide. Okay. <laughs> so uh, do I, so I understand you only check one box, but do you still record both the lost time and the transfer mm -hmm. dates? Yes. Okay. Yeah. You're just classifying it under one, you know, classification, but you're still tracking both last days, you know, last time and restricted time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for the company official to sign it, does the document need to be signed in ink or can it be typed? Well, I, I, I guess I should, it can be either or, but I should mention that it still has to be a paper form that's posted. You can't post in the electronic version. Okay. You want to post it somewhere where employees normally will pick up on company information, you know, whatever, you know, company bulletin board or whatever, something that employees normally go to to read up on any latest company information. So a couple of things. Yeah, it has to be posted in paper form and it has to be posted somewhere where employees typically go to to get information. Okay, I have one more question around this. Do mm -hmm. you have to average the number of hours worked last year or can you use exact numbers of hours worked? Well, you're trying to get an exact, but you do the best you can. Um, some places track it better. Otherwise, again, you just base it on number of employees times 2,000. If you have the capability to be exact, yeah, that's always better for yeah. you too. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. So, and the forms, they talk about keeping those forms within seven calendar days as far as current. Don't look at it as that requirement, but you want to make sure you do that for your benefit too, because the longer you wait, the less you remember and the less things you can change or possibly change to reduce it. Uh, an equivalent form of the same information as, as readable and understandable uh, as form as possible. And then forms can be kept on the computer as long as they can be produced when needed as the other access. It's, well, geez, Joe's not here. We don't have access anymore. That's that's not yeah. acceptable on yeah. that part. Because again, if you have an OSHA inspection, they're gonna wanna see it within four hours or they're, you know, yeah, they want you know they want to see the form, so you've got up to that amount of time. And pretty much, yeah, any any employee rep, it could be an authorized rep or a personal you know legal representative, they have to also have access you know within a business day. So that's that's where that 1904, 35, and 40 come into play. Okay, moving right along, so we can make sure we get through everything. Is the privacy protection again? 
Um, you can read the screen as well as I, but if there's issues like mental illness, HIV, uh, even on the COVID side, the needle sticks and stuff, where we want to make sure that this information is kept as private as possible, uh, you can change that 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 300 log as far as what you're posting within that, right, Dave? Yeah, you just you you don't you don't include names or, or really anything else that might identify the individual. You want to keep that on a separate form, and you want to be able to correlate the two, you know, so that you know on your separate log, your privacy log, you want to be able to correlate it to the the entry on the 300 log. Multiple business establishments, some of you may be having locations in three states or three different cities or whatever the case may be. Uh, keep a separate uh, 300 log for each establishment as expected to be in the operation for more than that year. Uh, may keep the OSHA form 300 for the short-term establishments and each employer must be linked to within that one establishment. Yeah. Um, again, <clears throat> if, if, you know, in this construction is a good example, they may have a lot of short-term establishments. They've got a lot of different projects. You can keep all the, you know, record keeping on one form for those kind of situations. But if you have a site that's going to be in operation for more than a year, then they would have to have their own injury log. And again, yeah, as Tim said, you, you link the employee to an establishment. Uh, because if something happens to them, maybe they're out, you know, on some work assignment, maybe they're not even at a specific establishment yet, and something happens, you have to be able to link that person back to an establishment. One thing, too, if an employee is linked to a certain establishment, but they get hurt at another, that other establishment would record the injury. Okay. Annual summary, we talked about that and the certification or the signing off on it and the posting. Uh, February, March, and April, they need to be posted. So uh, those of you that haven't completed it, you've got uh, a, a week and a half or two weeks to get that done and get that put up there. So if there are questions, please let us know. Uh, the company executive must sign. We've talked about that. And again, it gives you the bases and the posting dates. Mm -hmm. Retention and updating, retain forms for five years. OSHA normally will look at the current year plus three years, but they have that right to go deeper if they feel there's a reason for it, something doesn't look right, and they want to look back four or five years. So always keep that five-year um, category within that and then um, update that OSHA form 300 during that period of time if need to be updated. Uh, again, a change of uh, situations that may occur. Yeah. Dave, I'm going to let you cover the fatality and catastrophe uh, and the time of reporting and how that's documented. Yeah. I mean, anytime you have a, a fatality at work, you need to report it to OSHA within eight hours. If it happens to be on uh, outside of normal work hours, you should really, you should use the OSHA hotline. There's a 1-800 number that you could use. Uh, you know, if it happened on a Friday, you don't wait until the following Monday to report it. You either go online or use the 800 number. Um, These are timestamped too when yeah. you call them in, so they yeah. can they know that it was not within eight hours and not within eight hours yeah. too. And then for the other items listed, you know, the the inpatient hospitalization, and that relates to treatment. You know, if you're just being observed for a certain amount of time, that and nothing further is done, then you wouldn't have to call that in. But if they're actually an inpatient, it's being medically treated, then you would have to report that, um, as well as a work-related amputation, you know, or loss of an eye. You cover that third bowl a little bit more because that's to me confusing at yeah. times. Well, and again, yeah, if you're on a commercial or public transit, you know, you're flying on a plane, uh, for business or you're in a bus, you know, you don't have to report accidents related to that. You may still have to record it on your 300 log, but you don't have to report it to OSHA within a certain amount of time if it, if it results in a fatality or inpatient hospitalization or whatnot. Electronic reporting and in, in form, um, many but not all establishments must electronically report. And again, Dave was involved in this under the OSHA side, so he's going to explain a little bit yeah. more. But again, part of it is state and federal yeah. differentials on yeah. that. Um, the 20 to 249 classification of over 250 
So I'll let you cover that yeah. as far as tracking with that. Yeah, certain states, Minnesota included, they just opted to uh, require anyone with 20 or more employees to submit their 300A information on this injury tracking application that Federal OSHA has. There is no, you know, Federal OSHA states, they have certain uh, industries that are required when they're in that 20 to 249 employees with Minnesota, anybody, they don't have that any restrictions. So, so again, if you're under federal OSHA and you, you have a, uh, in your type of business is listed, uh, then yeah, you're gonna submit your data if you have over 20 employees. And then anyone over 250 would still have to, regardless of the type of in, industry that they're in. Dave. If there's any questions on that, please let us know. You can email yeah. us directly if there's something more specific. Yeah. And just that. remember, it's due March 2nd. Yep. And I, with the app, with the tracking application now, um, I did go to the site recently, and they're asking you to re-set up your login information, your login credentials, just as an FYI. So we've covered a lot of stuff in our, in our presentation. So take a few minutes. Uh, this isn't going to be public so it's it's a if this webinar was very helpful you had a good ideas a few or hey it um, wasn't really what you were looking for it gives us an area to continually improve on and change it as we put these uh, webinars on throughout the year so we'll take a couple of minutes for that and then there's a few other housekeeping issues we'll go through and uh, see if there's any other questions so I have a few. I have a few questions that uh, came up. So as people mm -hmm. are answering, maybe this. Um, so someone said that they saw the form mm -hmm. uh, needs to be certified by the office. Is that necessary? On the three hundred, on the three hundred A, it says certified. You know. mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, someone has to sign off on. It. Is that what? I, I guess I didn't quite. So the yeah, certified uh, was meaning somebody of, of high ranking yeah, official yeah. signed off on it. You just didn't have the shift supervisor sign it, that yeah, type of thing. Yeah. That's what that means. Yeah, again, it's got to be a high ranking company official, typically like an owner, officer of the corporation, um, or highest ranking person at that establishment. It, it doesn't need to be notarized. So we'll, we'll put it that way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, Thank if you. I have an injured employee who I recorded in 2022, but they are still being treated and have restrictions into 2023, do I have to put them on the 2023 form 300 as well? No. It stays all on the 2022. Your 2023 log is clean. Yeah, yeah. You always go back to the initial date of that injury or illness if you have to add any additional, you know, days or restrictions, anything like that. Yep. So okay. your days lost and everything falls back on 2022. So okay. that's where you, you may go back and update that log, you know, when that case is finally closed and the employee's back to work, you would go back and update the, 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 uh, the OSHA log uh, to um, show all that data. Okay, and again, if you have questions, you can certainly contact us directly. Yeah, here's our emails and, and, and phone numbers if you want to contact us. This is also uh, allowable for continuing ed. So if you're sitting here uh, watching the webinar and you need some CEU credits, uh, please uh, contact us and we'll get that information out to you so you can uh, add that to your educational file for those of you that are tracking and needing continuing ed hours. Uh, our next webinar is February 17th, uh, 11 to 2. It's on safety culture. Uh, it's, it's based on a book that OECS employees and ownership have read, have written, excuse me. Uh, and so it gives you a lot of good ideas on where good safety cultures and not so good safety cultures have worked and not worked. So I uh, look forward to um, those of you joining us that uh, want to really work towards improving the safety culture. So we got a few minutes left before we're done. If there's any questions that you want to throw out at us, we've got uh, five minutes uh, before the webinar is officially done. But uh, I really thank everybody for joining and asking the questions. They were good questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll open it up for any other ones in the few, uh, right now. Okay, I have one that come in. Um, came in. I missed the beginning of the meeting with employers under 10. We are under 10. Does that mean we don't have to submit our form? We just keep it in record and post it? Yeah, you don't even, yeah, you don't have to, as long as you've had 10 or fewer employees company-wide, you know, not just at an establishment, 
but company-wide, as long as you have 10 or fewer, you do not have to keep the 300 log. You don't have to post the 300A form. I mean, you can certainly do it if you want, but there's no requirement to do it. Okay. Does OECS work with companies on safety itch issues such as safety checklists, et cetera? Yeah, we can work with you on that. You just contact us individually or and we can we can work with you and, and help put things together if there's needs for that, yes. Okay, and we just have a lot of question, uh, a lot of responses saying thank you, very informative. Uh, and then oh, a, a few just came in right now. So let me just read that. So do we have to go online if there's no injuries that time? Oh, what? yeah. I if, if you haven't had injuries and you're required to keep a log, you're still going to complete it. You're still going to post the 300A. You're just going to have a lot of zeros. Even with that tracking application, that's, you know, you're going to, that's the information, that's the data you're going to submit. I mean, that injury tracking application is used, it's more so used by OSHA to help steer their, you know, where they want to devote their resources. You know, that's a totally separate thing from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the survey they issue. You may be asked to complete both. Um, just remember, you know, if you're required to keep a log, even if nothing happens, you don't have injuries, that's fine. You're just, that's that's what you're gonna have on the, on the log. You'll still have to keep your, your, your SIP code and the number of employees and the average hours on that far right, but the rest of the top categories would just be putting zeros in, yeah. which is great. That, that's that's, an, easy way to, that's yeah. an easy way to fill this form. <laughs> Okay, uh, we have a bunch more questions. So I'm going to do my best to get through them, guys. And then I'll just let you know when we have to cut them off. Uh, mm -hmm. Would we be, would we have to put an employee that is refusing retesting on a potential shift on a hearing test on our log as recordable? If they refuse a retest, um, yeah. I mean, if the original test showed that they had a shift or, you know, that it, would meet the recording criteria. Um, I think you'd still have to record it. I may have to look into that further because I know that you can't, you know, force someone to, you know, even do, you know, do a retest. But um, you may be able to show as to why you think the, you know, the test came back bad, and that that might, you know, be a reason to get around. But again. If 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 the if the test showed that they had you know a shift and it you know meets the recording criteria, you'd have to record it. Yep. But then put other notes down there of re reasons why, so yeah. it can be discussed if OSHA does come in and look at it and say, let's look at this situation. Well, you know, they play in a rock and roll band three nights a week or whatever type thing. You know, well, those, those, yeah. those, those are the definitions you can put in. I mean. It. I remember going to a facility where they had five hearing loss cases out of six cases total, and it was a small company. And I'm walking around with a sound level meter, and it, I was barely getting 80 decibels, not even, except for one area that maybe got up to 81. You know, I told the, the company official that was with me, it's like, you know, I highly doubt that these are recordable cases. You should be able to get a medical opinion that states that, you know, it didn't happen because of work. And he admitted, yeah, all five of them raced stock cars. So um, I think in those kind of situations, you know, you, you really can argue that you don't have to record it. It's not work related. So any other questions before you had to cut her off? Yes. Can you post a good link to an online portal to report three the 300 A form? Well, the injury tracking application is the link if that's if I'm understanding correctly. That was on a previous slide, but we can probably yeah. can we, go, we can go back right to where that is. Yep, you should. And I'm going to keep on going through these. Yeah, if you keep on going, I'll just go back to that slide where <laughs> right there's uh, your there's your link right there. You're, perfect. Okay. Um, are they able to get this recording? Yes, I believe we do send that out. It, it okay. takes us a, a, a day or so to get it to buy down, but my technical right. associate off to the left here says yes, we can send it to them if you uh, let us know. Okay, uh, let's see here. Do, fed do federally regulated companies with 20 to 249 employees have to report a form 300A to OSHA on an annual basis? If, if they're in that 
uh, uh, certain list of you know classifications. Uh, you know the OSHA standard. There's an appendix that has a listing of industry classifications that have to report that, and if they fall under that, yes. And that would include manufacturing, construction. So I mean, you would just have to look at the list to see. We have one more question, and then that's 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 all we have time for. Okay. Uh, clarifying earlier question, I've had this happen once before. Employee hits finger with hammer, refuses medical attention, calls in the next day and says, "I'm not coming in. My hand hurts." Is this sick time or lost? Is this sick day lost time? Next day, employee calls in, says, "I won't be in. I'm going to the doctor's today." Doctor says, "Finger is okay." Takes Advil and work restrictions for three days. Is this now reportable with lost days? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, if there is a medical opinion that says they have to take time off or that says they need a restriction, okay, then that's how you record it. But you're not required to have that medical opinion. And if it's not clear, um, the employer can make their best judgment as to whether they think that should have prevented them from working or you know could have potentially restricted them from work. So it's there, it's a little bit of a, you know, judgment call on the employer to determine, you know, if someone smashes their thumb and, and they just felt it disrupted too much their ability to work. Yeah, you know, that maybe could be considered one last day, but that's a bit of a judgment call for the employer there. Okay, all right, well guys, I wanna right. make sure that we stick to everyone's time. Uh, thank you, everyone. If we, if you have more questions, Tim and Dave both put in their contact information. And thank you. That concludes today's webinar. Everyone, have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you.